Okay, so uh, welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today we're very lucky to have one of SETI's own uh, star PIs, Mark Showalter, uh, who was a SETI Institute PI since uh, 2006. Well, sound, sounds right. Sounds right, yes. Uh, Mark uh, did his undergrad at uh, Oberlin College in Ohio and then did his master's and PhD work at uh, Cornell. Uh, and uh, he uh, worked, has worked uh, on the outer planets uh, for his entire career and he uh, started off working in the Voyager mission uh, where he uh, used Voyager data to discover uh, Jupiter's gossamer rings. Uh, during his uh, post-Voyager work, he uh, has discovered new satellites of Saturn, the 18th one. Uh, and in recent years, since moving to the SETI Institute, uh, he has discovered a couple of new moons of Uranus, Mab and Cupid, and uh, also two new faint rings around Uranus. Uh, he is the leader of the PDS, that's Planetary Data System Rings <coughs> Node, uh, which employs a few people who are in the audience tonight. Uh, and uh, that they are based here at SETI. Uh, and he's a co i on the Cassini uh, team uh, that uh, is currently orbiting in the Saturn system. Uh, tonight, uh, Mark is going to talk to us about uh, the discovery of uh, interactions between uh, rings of Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, and uh, their surprising effects, uh, as was reported in a science article that just got published a couple of weeks ago. So if you'll join me in welcoming Mark. Okay. Uh, I have a kind of a story to tell. It's a research project that's been going on for the last year or so, and I've told bits and pieces of it at various science meetings over the last year. But when Adrian invited me to speak, I thought, oh great, I finally get to tell the whole story all the way through from beginning to end. And that's kind of fun for me. Now, I realize I made a bit of a mistake, or maybe I guess just the part about publishing the story made it a mistake already. Uh, it's a mystery story. But I think rule number one, if you're a mystery writer, is don't entitle your novel, The Butler Did It. But uh, in fact, as you will see, Shoemaker Levy 9 is the culprit in this story, and I hope you'll try to forget that, even though you know it already. Maybe you don't know quite what Shoemaker Levy 9 did yet, so we'll have something to fill in, and at least try to maybe hear the story from the standpoint of myself as we were going through it, because although it may not be surprising to you, it was quite a hell of a surprise to us. And uh, you know, this is still, of all the research projects I've ever done, this is the one where I still look back at it and say, you've got to be kidding me. But uh, so let's go forward. And uh, we're going to start, though, with something very, very obscure, an obscure feature and an obscure ring. It is uh, a view here of the Jovian ring system looking back from the shadow of Jupiter, November 9th, 1996, picture taken by the Galileo spacecraft. These were the first images of Jupiter's ring system that came back from Galileo. And if you look in the green box, that is now one image of the several that were mosaic together here. And I'm going to zoom in on it. And it shows something that I think is very exciting. Um, there were probably two or three other people in the world at the time who actually also thought it was very exciting. You know, we're not normal, I'll grant that. But if you look very closely, there's something very peculiar about the lighting along this tip of the ring, which is seen only about half a degree open here. As you can see, there are some very subtle bright, dark, bright, dark variations. And a few of us figured out what that could mean. And let me show you now. I'm going to zoom in a little bit, uh, up the contrast just a bit. And now let's uh, push that a little bit further. And now I think you can get almost the sense that there's a ripple pattern, uh, bright and dark, as if the whole ring were undulating in some manner. That's because that's exactly what the ring is doing. If you draw a line now through the tip of the ring, which we call the ansa, you can see that certain features are bright on one side of the ansa, but then get dark on the other. Or they're dark on one side and bright on the other. 
and that's a repeating pattern as you go inward. Here is a sort of cartoon illustration in which you can see I've just made a, a wireframe pattern of a ripply ring and you can see places where it's brighter and then opposite across the ansa line or places where it's darker and vice versa. So now we can go back to the original image and you can see basically the same phenomenon at work, bright and dark, bright and dark, changing contrast as you cross the ansa line. Well, one of the reasons we get these variations in brightness has, has to do with the fact that because we've got a bent ring, a rippled ring, you can consider some lines of sight. Suppose we're off up through the ceiling, looking down through the rings. Sometimes our line of sight passes through a long path, and sometimes it has a short path, and sometimes a long path. And so what we see in these circumstances is variations in brightness. So instead of a solid uniform ring, it becomes one that's kind of bright in some areas and dark in others. And that's another sign that uh, either the ring has got concentrations of material in it or it's got vertical bends, and in this case, they're bends. Just to make sure we are all on the same page in terms of terminology, a pattern like this has a wavelength, just like, uh, just like the waves on an ocean. Uh, and in this case, in the Jovian ring, it's about 2,000 kilometers. It's got a vertical amplitude. How far do you go out of the equatorial plane of the ring? And that's about two kilometers in this case. So, that doesn't just happen by itself. There's got to be a reason for that. And as I said, the two or three of us on the planet actually thought this was interesting and worth, worth further study. Uh, let me show you the one case where we know of that a planetary ring does have large vertical ripples. This is called a bending wave. This is a pattern imposed in the rings of Saturn by the satellite Mimas. This is a place in the rings where the ring particles go around the planet five times every time Mimas goes around three times. That's called a resonance, and because Mimas is actually a bit out of the ring plane, it pulls material up and down, and that material then propagates and forms this tightly wound spiral pattern. It's quite beautiful, but it's also nothing like what's going on at Jupiter. Jupiter doesn't have a dense ring. There aren't any satellites in the right places, so we knew at the outset that whatever is making the Jovian ring ripple has got to be very, very different from that one case that we know about in, in Saturn system. All right. The uh, Galileo mission went on for quite a few more years after this. It actually ran until 2003, and the images I showed you were from 1996. Uh, but if you will recall, this was the uh, NASA's one experiment, or, or last experiment, I should at least say, with an umbrella style of high-gain antenna. It was supposed to open up, have a nice, nice focused parabol parabolic shape that would uh, enable lots of high-speed communication with the Earth. It never opened properly, and so Galileo was very, very limited in its data communications with the Earth. Instead, this little feature out here is called the low-gain antenna, and that's what they used. And they still managed to rewrite everything we know about the satellite Europa. They did enormous, uh, huge studies of all the, sa all the satellites, of the planetary system, and, and so on. So it was a really successful mission, but much less a mission than it might have been if that antenna had not gotten stuck. So speaking of the Jovian ring, we don't have a lot more data to work with. When you see that funny ripple pattern, you say, gosh, let's look at it again. This, believe it or not, is the next best images we've got of the Jovian ring. Uh, they don't look very pretty. I'll grant you that. I'll work with them again in a little later in the talk. But what's going on here, first of all, we're actually, this is the best resolution we ever got on the Jovian ring. Uh, we've got about uh, 10 kilometers per pixel along the tip of the ring here. Um, so this is actually very interesting, but you're looking through a blizzard. That blizzard is actually charged particles bouncing around in the magnetic field of Jupiter. And they basically, some of them hit the CCD on the camera. They leave a bright spot. And so if you do a long exposure, as, as you need for something as faint as the Jovian ring, you're going to get a blizzard like that. So uh, not impressive to look at, but basically that's what's happening there. You can brighten up the contrast, but of course you brighten up the blizzard then too. So this is a rather frustrating set of images, but I'll be returning to it later. Now I mentioned earlier that the uh, wavelength of the pattern we're talking about is about 2,000 kilometers. Because we were so close to the ring at this time, you can see what a 1,000 kilometer scale bar looks like. It basically spans that tip of the ring, the part that you see right there. So it's going to be really hard to see a 2,000 kilometer wavelength when you only have maybe 3,000 kilometers of data at all on the ring. So, uh, so this image looked rather hopeless to us as a, as a target for studying these features.
Okay, we got a few more a little bit later in 2000. Uh, we get a longer swath of information about the rings, but once again, there's a lot of artificial, of um, uh, instrumental defects that, that cause these vertical lines. There's still a lot of snow. Uh, there's some smear, um, difficult images to work with, and no real sign whatsoever of that ripple pattern that I showed you once. So if any project had ever hit a dead end, this was probably it. And although it seemed kind of interesting to know what was going on there, we're probably not going to find out from the Galileo data alone. We had one more chance, however, and that was New Horizons. I was on the team that did the uh, encounter planning for the Jupiter flyby. New Horizons is on its way to Pluto now. It will get there in 2015. It had, was on a very fast path where it was launched in, in early 2006 and was already at Jupiter just about a year later. We had a very frantic time planning that flyby, but nevertheless, because I was one of the people who cared, uh, here is an Excel spreadsheet. Maybe you people don't realize this. Spacecrafts are all planned using Excel spreadsheets, believe it or not. <laughs> but if you look at this nice purple batch, this was where we were getting some particularly good viewing geometry on the Jovian ring during the flyby. And the phrasing came in, Jupiter ring, main ring vertical structure, including ripples. So I still had not given up on ripples, and there were the observations to prove it. And here we have one of the images that we got from that period of time. Let me throw on a scale bar, in fact. So there's some instrumental defects. Once again, there's a lot of glare in the optics just because you need to do a long exposure. Um, but really, no sign of ripples at all. And I would have thought you'd be able to see them in there. So it looks like that really is a dead end because we just don't have any more new Jupiter data coming down the pike, at least not from spacecraft. You can still do perfectly well from the Earth for some purposes, of course. All right. So. That's it for Jupiter for now. We, are, we have hit a dead end. Whatever those silly ripples are, we're not going to figure them out. But we now have a spacecraft that arrives in 2004 at Saturn. So I'm going to switch now to a new spacecraft. It's a new decade. It's a new planet. It's a new ring system. Uh, even I have to admit it's a much prettier ring system than Jupiter's. But here I want to just give you some, some terminology. We uh, have names for the rings, the uh, working outward, inward. It's the A, B, C, and D. There are also rings E, F, and G, outward and scattered about. Uh, the C ring you can probably see. The D ring you cannot. It's very, very faint. But there really is material there. It was actually discovered. Um, it had been hypothesized that there was stuff there by Earth-based observers, but they were wrong long ago. But nevertheless, the D ring name, the D -ring name had already been stuck to this empty region of space. So when Voyager saw something in that empty region of space, they said, let's call it the D-ring. It was sort of an obscure story there. Anyway, uh, but yes, to prove that there really is something going on in the D-ring. The C-ring is out here. Here is a nice view looking kind of upward right along the shadow. This is the shadow of Saturn cutting across the ring plane. And there you can see some little ringlets and a bit of structure out here. And then somewhere right about out here is where the C-ring begins. So there really is a very faint uh, ring with some interesting structure in it that is now known as the D-ring, even though it has no bear, bears no relation to what was originally called the D-ring, except occupying the same space. Uh, here's another image from early in the Cassini tour showing the D-ring. In fact, this one does not. It's a wide angle image, though. But the wide angle image has a narrow angle image that's co-aligned with it. And this narrow angle image happened to just be perfectly pointed to pick up the D-ring, which you still can't see. But if I turn up the contrast a little bit, well, there it is. And maybe you can even see, oh, you have to, not really. But there's another ringlet in there and so on. But what's particularly interesting and caught the attention of my colleague Matt Hedman is this little ramp region just interior to the C-ring, where the D-ring is brightest. So let's zoom in on that, turn up the contrast a bit. And he noticed that there was this pattern, something going on uniformly spaced. In fact, uh, you can measure the wavelength of this pattern very easily. Here I've just drawn a bunch of lines uniformly spaced at 32 kilometers, and you can see they line up on those bright features pretty well throughout this region. So even though it's very noisy and grainy and so on, it's pretty clear that there's some kind of wave-like, I don't know what else to describe it, but there's certainly some kind of periodic pattern in the inner D-ring, or I'm sorry, the outer D-ring in the inner rings. And we don't know what to make of that, and we didn't at the time. Wavelength is about 32 kilometers. So we filed that away, and my colleague Matt was studying this particular ring. Here we got a much better view, at least, that shows that there is a very distinct periodic feature in the uh, 
in the D-ring. Matt's a pretty perceptive guy. He knew about this little ripple pattern. He probably wasn't born in time to be one of those three people who cared about it at Jupiter. But nevertheless, he was aware of it, and he noted in this particular edge-on view of the D-ring, let's zoom in on that. Here's a little close-up of the ANSA. And what you can see, maybe, are some contrast reversals as you cut across the ANSA line. Let me, uh, let me make sure everybody can see that. I'll do a, a little bit of a filtering, and I'll draw the line in. And there we go. And now we can see very distinctly the contrast reversals that are just like what we saw at the Jupiter ring. Uh, something bright above the red line becomes dark below and vice versa. There's a very distinct offset in these patterns. And it even looks kind of in our brain that, that registers as ripples. In this case, the amplitude is only 30 meters. So it's a very different, uh, very different feature from what we saw at Jupiter where it was a couple of kilometers. And also the wavelength is about 30 kilometers here where it was 2000 at Jupiter. Okay, so there's something interesting. Once again, this is the sort of thing that just doesn't happen by itself. Somebody's got to be forcing it, but there are no satellites nearby. The kinds of things that make these periodic patterns in rings just aren't there in the D-ring. So something funny's going on. So Matt made some measurements. Here are measurements by time along the horizontal and his measurements of the wavelength of the pattern. Now he got one observation in 2004, about 34 kilometers, and then a whole cluster that ended up being more like 32. We looked at this and thought, eh, this guy is probably just an outlier. We looked at the image, it's not a very high quality image. So we could believe that we've just got a measurement of some weird 32 kilometer feature. But as I said, these don't come across, come along just by themselves. Here's our observations with the 2005 data added. It all seemed kind of consistent with this number of around 32 kilometers. And then we got 2006. And it seemed like, well, maybe we shouldn't have been quite so skeptical of 2004 after all, because I look at data like that and I say, I think there's a trend there. What that seems to be saying is that this is winding up. This is some kind of a spiral pattern. We've seen other spirals, but they were always related to resonances in the rings with exterior satellites. We've got some kind of spiral pattern that is winding up as we watch it so that it has changed from 34 to 31 kilometers in a period of just three years. That's kind of strange. So, um, okay, we're interested again, let's keep going. We had an additional, I give Matt credit for this, he remembered a bit of data that I had completely forgotten about. But uh, let me just take a little sidetrack. There's another type of observation we do in rings called stellar occultations. And under certain circumstances, a star can be seen to pass behind the rings of Saturn, or any ring, but mostly we see it at Saturn. And when that happens, you can measure the brightness of the, of the star as a function of time as it passes behind the ring, and that star will blink in and out as it passes behind features, and if you measure the brightness, you get a nice profile of how much material is in the way. So this ring is opaque, then the star reappears, and now it's partly visible through the A-ring, and then on out to the end. So we get profiles at extremely high resolution, even from Earth. Uh, doing these kinds of observations. Now, most of these are done by Cassini nowadays, but we had an opportunity in, two, in 1995 when a star did pass behind the rings of Saturn as seen from Earth. Uh, here is an image uh, from the Hubble telescope that uh, I was actually on the team that took this image. It looks rather weird. Let me fill in some context. So we've got Saturn off to the right here. We've got a couple of moons, and this is a long exposure, so the moons are kind of streaked out. Uh, it's actually two images put together, which is why there's a gap in between. Uh, if you look carefully, the rings are very, very dark here. And the reason for that is that it was equinox. The sun was shining directly along the ring plane, and that means the rings don't reflect much light. But nevertheless, I've got A, B, C, and D identified. And here is this particular star that was, at this time, had just finished passing behind the rings. I'm actually going to play a sequence of images backwards because we were studying the image, uh, just the light scattering properties from Equinox, but at the same time, some colleagues slash competitors, I wouldn't say, but people who were competing for the exact same block of time, when by ridiculous coincidence, we had Equinox going on at Saturn and a star passing behind the rings for no good reason at exactly the same time. But anyway, you can see that our observations begin with this star just coming out from behind the rings. I played that sequence backwards, as I said. So let me replay it, and you can now extrapolate to where its position was shortly before our first observations, and that would be right about there. And our colleague Amanda Bosch 
was actually using the faint object spectrograph, a different instrument on, on Hubble, to observe the star as it passed behind the D-ring and then most of the C-ring and got that occultation data. Here's what she found. So remember, this is 1995. This is 10 years earlier than the first Cassini data. Nevertheless, she detected the D-ring. And anybody see anything kind of fishy going on here? There's kind of a regular pattern of spikes. Let me point it out. And there are the spikes. And let's just put in the number. There's something there, but it's about 60 kilometers in wavelength. But it's exactly the same location as what Matt was seeing in the Cassini data at a 30 kilometer wavelength. Well, hey, maybe there's a trend here. Matt's a clever guy. So this is what I showed you earlier just from Cassini. Now let's draw that same data set, but with one extra data point thrown in, which is Amanda Bosch's measurement from 1995. And that really looks like a trend. OK. We, um, we rings geeks understand how you can do something like that, at least in a, in a descriptive way. So let me show that to you. Suppose we have a ring, and I'm just putting it edge on around a planet. We're going to recognize, even though I guess I've drawn it as a circle, that the planet is actually a bit flattened. Uh, and that affects the gravity field in an interesting way. Well, let's just suppose, don't ask me why, don't ask me how, but let's just suppose that we tilted that ring. So up it goes a little bit off its axis. Now, because the planet is oblate, the ring really doesn't want to stay that way, but there's no damping, so it ends up being in this kind of tilted state. But so let's... Um, Thing is, it doesn't stay that way for very long because the planet makes rings wobble. When you, whenever you tilt a ring, it's going to wobble, and that is just a predictable phenomenon. And it has to do with the fact that the planet is slightly, slightly flattened. So here we have a wobbling ring, which had been tilted for reasons that we can't imagine uh, at the beginning when I first hit the go button on my RIT simulation. OK, now there was one ring. Well, we can do the same thing with a bigger ring. Nothing wrong with that. And it will also do the same kind of wobble. But it is further from the planet. Further from the planet, the gravity is just a little bit weaker. And the wobble rate is a little bit slower. And as a result, if you tilt a ring all at once, it won't all stay that way. It will take on a different form. And here, I can now show you, if you don't want to get too dizzy, is a simulation for the entire, uh, entire flat ring. So first we tilt it all at once, and then we let it go. And what do we see? Is it not playing? Maybe I didn't hit. OK, here we go. So now, at first they were all together, but these rings are wobbling faster than these rings, simply because they're further from the planet. And over time, what started as a flat ring becomes a kind of ripply ring. And in fact, those ripples get closer and closer together. In fact, what happens is every time this ring wobbles one time fast further than this ring, you get one more ripple into the pattern. So there you can see the whole thing just winding up as you go. So a spiral pattern that is winding up tighter and tighter with time. Seems like a perfect explanation for what Matt saw in his data from Cassini and in Amanda's data from 1995. Now. When I showed you the plot before, I showed you uh, wavelength going, let's see, I'm sorry, I guess I have turned it around or I've sw switched two slides. Let me try this. OK, this is what I showed you before uh, with the wavelength going downward over time. But really what's happening is you've, we're thinking in the wrong terms. It's not the wavelength, it's the reciprocal of the wavelength that matters. When you tilt an entire ring, that has a wavelength of infinity. And a wavelength of infinity is sort of hard to work with, but if you Take us reciprocal, that's just zero. And zero is easy. We like zero. So the wave number is the term that we use for the inverse of the wavelength. And if the wave number starts at zero, then at a certain time it's small and it grows bigger. And this particular phenomenon of these ripply rings that I showed you in the simulation predicts a particular rate at which the rings should wind up. And it predicts that in units of wave number, it should happen as a straight line. And sure enough, spanning there a good 10, 12 year time period, that's a pretty, pretty amazingly straight line. Furthermore, we had no choice about the slope of this line. That's just Saturn's gravity field. You can do a calculation and calculate what it should be. So there's no mystery here. What's going on is that something tilted the ring 
so that it was about a wavelength of 60 kilometers back in 95, and it's about 30 kilometers today. All right, well, what can do such a thing? First of all, let's, let's just extrapolate that a little further. So if you take the straight line down, it reaches a wave number of zero, which means the entire ring tilted in late 1983. So something tilted the D-ring in 1983, and that can explain everything we see, except how the heck do you tilt a ring? Uh, it's not an easy thing to do. There's a lot of mass in the rings of Saturn. Um, but that's what we said. And in 2007, we published a paper with this initial result. Um, we were throwing around all kinds of crazy ideas. I like this one just because I like the charm of the fact that Matt actually scribbled it out on his chalkboard. Uh, but the idea is that at least, you know, the D-ring doesn't have a lot of material in it. It's pretty small. It's close to the planet where the gravity field is deep, so things are going to fall to, and more likely you're going to have things coming through that region. So maybe something punctured the D-ring sometime around late 1983, and it just carried with it enough oomph that it tilted a piece of the ring, and over time that kind of spread out for all of the other ring material, and you, in effect, had uh, what we see today as this rippled ring in the D-ring. Well, that seemed like a good story. It all kind of made sense. And uh, then we got a sort of kick in the pants. And that came in 2009 during the next equinox of Saturn, the most recent equinox of Saturn. The sun was passing from the south to the north side of the rings. When that happens, for a time, it's shining directly along the ring plane. So the ring is very, very dark. And that's why the rings look so strange in this image. Right around August 12th was when the equinox happened. When we, uh, when we see sunsets on our own planet, what do we notice? We notice things like shadows getting longer. And that exact same thing happens in the rings of Saturn. So their imaging team found just a treasure trove of interesting things about the vertical structure in the rings of Saturn. This is the outer edge of the B ring. This is the Cassini division, a gap out here. And little did we know until this lighting came along that there are essentially mountains on the, they're very transient mountains, but they look like mountains, uh, on the edge of the B-ring that are caused by this material that gets squashed in and out by a particular, uh, another resonance with the satellite Mimas. Here we have the satellite Daphnis, which orbits within one of the outermost gaps, the outermost gap in the rings of Saturn. Here it's casting a long shadow, and here it's creating ripples and wakes in the ring edge, which are also casting shadows. So just beautiful stuff came out of this equinox period. But as you may well have guessed by the fact that I'm talking about it, that's not really the whole story. Here we have the, B, the C ring, the uh, next ring out from the D ring. But uh, here we saw it in 2005. Nothing particularly special about this particular region. This exact same region in 2009 looks very different. And the reason is the sunlight is coming in along the ring plane. And this is the same, this is, well, it is a ripple pattern, I'll say for now. This is a vertical, these are shadows cast by ups and downs of the features in the ring. And that's the reason we didn't see it until this special lighting geometry came along. Here's another image showing essentially the entire, it's a mosaic showing the entire C-ring. And now if I turn up the contrast on that, you can see this ripple pattern going all the way out across the entire C-ring. It's everywhere. There is no place that you do not see this feature unless the signal noise just doesn't warrant it. So whatever was messing around with the D-ring looks like it might have been messing around with the C-ring too. And in fact, here is the measure set of measurements that Matt took of the wavelength of this pattern as a function of location in the ring. So we have the D-ring. This is the stuff we knew about for a few years. And this is the stuff we all learned about during the equinox in 2009. You can, I think you would agree that that all sort of goes on one line together and says to me that this is one pattern. And it wasn't just some dinky little pattern in the D-ring. It crosses the entire C-ring. In fact, we know the gravity of Saturn, so we can predict what the shape is that this feature ought to have. And here it is. And there's really essentially no unknowns in that. This is just pretty much what it has to be. And you can see that essentially all those points fall right along. Interestingly enough, they go a little bit awry in the D-ring. You're so close to the planet there that we don't actually know the gravity of the planet very well. Things get more complicated close to these big oblate squashed planets. And so in fact, we're actually learning more about the gravity field of Saturn from this little deviation than uh, we ever thought we would. But nevertheless, we have something going on that tilted not just the D-ring, but the entire C-ring way back in 1983.
So conclusions for this point in my talk. Something, I'll just put it in quotes, tilted the C-ring and the D-ring in late 1983. Think about what that means. We're talking about tens of thousands of kilometers, all shifted off by, by tens of meters. So whatever it was, it wasn't just the D-ring. It was big. Something big happened in 1983. And uh, the next conclusion, well, Matt and I talking, yeah, maybe we ought to take another look at that Jupiter thing. OK, switching gears now, let's go back to Jupiter. And at this point, I don't have any better ideas of what's going on, but I have a lot more motivation to try to figure out what the heck is going on in this image. So here we have the image that was taken in 1996. There are actually three of them. They're essentially identical, though, showing exactly the same structure. And at the bottom, you can see what happens with a little bit of uh, careful image processing. So let me now just locate the ups and downs as little red lines. You can see them, I hope, uh, in the lower picture. Every dark patch has been marked. Um, so we've got ripples, that's for sure. But this is a very, very different pattern from anything we saw at Saturn. In Saturn, it was perfectly regular. It was 32 kilometers, or whatever the number was at the, that moment. But it pretty much stayed that way. It grew a little bit longer with distance from the planet, but it was nice and well behaved. We're seeing on almost, seems like kind of a random pattern here. Um, so that we need to understand, but nevertheless, it does seem to be some kind of ripple pattern. And that's as much as we know about it. This is the only time we ever saw it, after all. So I could use those slope, those brightness variations to make a measurement of the slope of the ring. And here it is. So ups and downs of the ring. This is the literal ups and downs of the Jovian ring as seen in a set of three images taken in 1996. Um, we're measuring actually not, I'm sorry, this isn't the vertical height, this is the slope. But notice the slopes get up to two degrees. That's not a small distance. If you're walking a two degree slope, you know it. It's not the same as flat. So imagine thousands of kilometers of the Jovian ring all tilted at that seemingly subtle two degrees. And uh, what would be going on in here? Well, those of you who have done a little bit with uh, uh, math or signal analysis sometimes or engineering, might have heard of something called Fourier analysis. And it's a way of saying, suppose this is really just made up of a couple of sinusoidal patterns. What are those patterns? And the way you do that, you perform the Fourier, the Fourier transform, and suddenly a couple of peaks jump up above the rest of the kind of a noise. And here I've marked them in red and blue. It seems that, in fact, we're seeing two different peaks two different waves superimposed upon each other in the Jovian ring. And that's why it wasn't so obvious what was going on, is that it was two waves, not one. So let's take a look. Suppose now we were to just say, suppose I have exactly two waves, one of this wavelength and one of this wavelength, and try to add them together to make the pattern we see in the Jovian ring. So here we are before, and here in the green line is after. It's not a great match, but on the other hand, if you notice, every time there's a peak in the Jovian data, there's a peak in the model. And every time there's a trough in the model, there's a trough in the, or a trough in the data, there's a trough in the model. And the alignment, even though the amplitudes kind of go off and on a little bit, the locations of the features are almost dead on perfect all the way across. So all it took was two wavelengths to model that weird feature that we see in the Jovian ring. So it means that if there's a ripple pattern in the Jovian ring, it's really two ripple patterns, not one. But it's not necessarily all that different from what we saw at Saturn. All right, well, we're desperate now. As I said, we don't have any more data. We know what we've got. So let's take another look at this one. Well, I've learned a thing or two about image processing over the years. One of the things you can do is go through this image and say, if a pixel is very bright, but none of its neighbors are bright, it's probably just one of those um, cosmic ray hits or magnetic charged particle hits on the, cosmic, on the CCD. So we can actually do some statistical tests and say, if you're too wrong, compared to your neighbors, you probably are wrong, and we're going to delete you. And when you do that, you can actually suppress an awful lot of that noise and get much prettier pictures of the Jovian ring. Still, maybe not Saturn quality excitement, but hey, I think it's cool. Anyway, so we're doing better. We're starting to see the Jovian ring more clearly in this special set of images. Now, the other point is that we've got two images taken at the same time. So where there's a bright little glitch on one, there probably isn't on the other. So if we can overlay those two images together in a sensible way, we can push the noise down further. And sure enough, there we go. This is the best I could do with the Jovian ring data. And uh, this is, uh, so this is the profile. 
And then when you do the processing to see is there any asymmetry contrast variations, here's what you get. And it's a pretty noisy image, but I hope you see dark up here, bright down here, dark over here, bright here, dark, bright, and so on. Dark, bright, bright, dark, bright, dark, so on. So we can measure, once again, a vertical pattern in the ring of Jupiter. And here is what we get. Once again, these are slopes. They're of order two degrees and even up to three degrees in this case. And we can do that Fourier analysis. And that Fourier analysis will tell us it's not a simple sinusoid, obviously. But, oh, look, it's got two frequencies. And um, in fact, I've actually kind of grayed out mostly, but I've shown the first Fourier profile is shown underneath the second one in subtle gray. I hope you can see it there. And if you see that red feature has marched forward or moved forward, or at least there are two features and two features in each one, and they are spaced exactly the same. It's as if the red feature and the blue feature have been marching toward the right in these plots from 1996 to 2000 while being separated by exactly the same amount. That is exactly what you expect based on this Ripley ring model. So let's take a look at that. Here is the uh, profile derived from those two frequencies. So the thing is, we never saw any ripple pattern in anything but that first set of Jovian ring images from Galileo because we were looking for the wrong wavelength. And once you understand that, you can start finding these things in the data. And sure enough, here are the two wavelengths that we were able to pull out of the uh, data from 2000 in the Galileo data. Now, remember I showed you, this is what we did with Saturn. We had a bunch of points and we had a line that had to obey a certain slope and we extrapolated back and we got to a point when the whole ring tilted and that was 1983 in this case. So let's do that for Jupiter. So here are our measurements. We've got two measurements from 1996, two measurements from, from 2000. We're going to draw a straight line that uh, is going to be what Jupiter forces us to do. And in fact, it goes directly through the points. And it says that those patterns were ring tilts without any other rippling. In one pattern happened, something, something tilted the ring between January and May of 1990, and something else tilted the ring between July and September of 1994. Well, this is where I can't turn back time. Um, but it was a lot of fun for the last year or so, where I was giving these partial talks at science meetings, and I could say, I was very careful not to mention anything in my abstract about Shoemaker-Levy 9. I just say we're studying the ripples in the rings, blah, blah, blah. But where does that date July to September 1994 ring a bell? And uh, I remember, very rarely do you hear gasps from a scientific audience, but I, I did on a few occasions. It was kind of gratifying. July 19th, 1994, front page of the New York Times, above the fold, Earth-sized storm and fireballs shake Jupiter as a comet dies. At the same time that Shoemaker-Levy 9 was crashing into Jupiter, something was tilting the rings of Jupiter. Okay, that sounds kind of fishy. Uh, we could call that a smoking gun even. I think Shoemaker-Levy 9 is, uh, is our smoking gun and probably had something to do with the tilting of the Jovian ring. And we're now understanding that all these years later. So let me remind you a little bit about Shoemaker-Levy 9. We only know this from retrospect that it was probably captured into orbit around Jupiter in the 1920s or so. We really don't know. It's actually very uncertain anything before about July 1992. At that time, it passed very close to Jupiter, actually went through inside the ring, uh, just a few tens of thousands of kilometers above the cloud tops in units of Jovian radii. That's what RJ means here. At that point, the tides of Jupiter were so strong that it broke into many pieces. And here is an actual Hubble image showing the fragments of Shoemaker-Levy 9 some months later when it was spread out into a string of pearls, as it was often called. But even in July 1992, we didn't know this was happening. It wasn't until 1993 when uh, Jean and oh, Carolyn Shoemaker and um, no, Jean Levy, uh, you, I'm sorry, David. David, thank you. David Levy and Jean Shoemaker and Carolyn Shoemaker found Shoemaker-Levy 9 as this fuzzy blotch off to the side of Jupiter and when they got some more data, we gradually realized a couple of things about it. The reason it looked weird, even when they discovered it, it didn't look like your typical comet. The reason it looked weird was that it had just broken up some months earlier as it passed by Jupiter. And then as we learned more about it, we realized that it had passed Jupiter for the last time. Because with uh, the way the orbit was set up, it was going to plow into Jupiter in 1994. And of course, then all the world's telescopes were watching 
that show that produce huge fireballs on the planet. And uh, here, just one infrared image. At the moment, when one of the impacts hit Jupiter, the impacts hit around behind the limb, but they produce such big fireballs that in the infrared you could actually see, see this glow, this explosion essentially off the limb of Jupiter in this Earth-based telescope, which is in South America. Uh, furthermore, where previous impacts had happened, and that, of course each of those bodies eventually hit the planet, uh, you could see the storm or, or turmoil and heat that was left behind. Uh, in the visual wavelengths, here's the Hubble image showing one of the impact scars. These lasted for a quarter months before they finally disappeared. But uh, of course at the time that was considered a once a century event. No one had ever imagined that things would be plowing into Jupiter on a regular basis. It was a great story and hence the coverage in the New York Times. Well, as I said earlier, I thought I was at a dead end and well, let's go back to that New Horizons data set. Remember the spreadsheet, lots of ripple requests that I was trying to study these. Uh, so I processed the heck out of a set of the best images of, from New Horizons these are, this is what you get when you combine together about five images very carefully. And uh, I don't know what 108 means. But anyway, uh, let's just say that's not having anything to do with me. But when you put the uh, processing together, once you see bright, dark, bright, dark. And here we can do the profile of the, uh, actually the Fourier transform of that profile. At this point, we would expect the Shoemaker-Levy 9 feature way out here. And I studied this pretty long, and I tend to believe that that is actually a real detection. Still at Shoemaker-Levy 9, its ripple pattern now 13 years after the fact. Uh, the other pattern, the one that was marked in blue all along, seems to have faded out of existence. But of course, that's not all you see here. You see two more features, two more ripple patterns in the Jovian ring, which had not been there in 2000, which was the last time we looked. And these seem to be indicators of additional features. So something appears hit the Jovian ring in December of 2003 and something else in September of 2001. And once again, threw it off its axis. Now, I'm just going to uh, uh, go very rapidly through the last slide or two here. I, we've got essentially a numerical coincidence as best anybody can tell. Something happened at the same time that a comet was hitting the planet, but what could do that to the ring? Let me just show you the uh, the comet itself was following this green trajectory shown here and here. It was coming up toward Jupiter from the south uh, and it hit the southern hemisphere. It never actually hit the, hit the rings. It never crossed the ring plane. So surely the fragments of Shoemaker-Levy 9 that we knew about, they had nothing to do with whatever happened to the Jovian ring. But what we realized with a lot of analysis is that there is something called solar radiation pressure, which is marked here. It is in this diagram pushing toward the left. And when particles are small enough, they actually feel a push of sunlight in addition to the pull of gravity, of Jupiter's gravity and both the sun and sun's gravity as well. And they were actually on different trajectories in this 1994, July 94 time. So at the same time as all the big fragments that are immune to the force from the sun were plowing into the planet, a lot of dust was actually plowing through the system and particles around 50 microns or so we're plowing directly into the main ring of Jupiter. When you do a lot of math and a lot of questionable assumptions, I'll grant you, uh, what we came up with is a number of about two cubic kilometers of dust. If that was how much material got produced when Shoemaker-Levy 9 broke up in 1992, then that was enough to, tilt, to shift the entire Jovian ring by two kilometers. So, Shoemaker-Levy 9, nobody really knows how big it was. There are estimates that are down to of order a couple of cubic kilometers, and we can't really claim that all that stuff went into dust because we know full well that there were some big fragments. But the biggest estimates of Shoemaker-Levy 9 are 5, 10 kilometers in radius. If it's 10 kilometers in radius, then you're up getting it to be around 1,000 kilometers of cubic volume, and all you need is a couple of cubic uh, kilometers of that to be made into dust, and the Jovian ring goes off its axis. So we seem to be compatible with the idea that the Jovian ring was pushed off its axis by the dust associated with Shoemaker-Levy 9. So this is my quote artist rendering. Uh, by sh sheer coincidence, this happens to be roughly the proportions of the cover of Science Magazine. Um, <laughs> they have not told us yet. The article, by the way, has been in the, in the online journal. Uh, and I think maybe out this week in the, in the paper journal. I'm not certain of that yet. 
But they have not told us whether they're going to be using this or not. But I essentially stole a couple of Hubble images and the Hubble images and Galileo images and then threw some swooshes in in Photoshop. And that's what you see. But uh, you, know, you may see this on Friday when it comes out, or you may never see it again. But I thought it was fun to do. It was something to do. Uh, just to prove to you that we all did our homework, as I said, there was a lot of math involved. This is Matt's slide. So the question then becomes, what happened at Saturn? We've only proved that one feature in Jupiter's ring was caused by a comet. But at least reasoning by analogy, you can kind of envision that something comparable coming along at Saturn could do a similar thing there. In fact, in late 1983, when something tilted the rings of Saturn, Saturn was in conjunction. It was on the far side of the sun. So nobody on planet Earth was watching it. So who knows what happened there? Of course, there might not have been anything to see anyway. But at least we have, uh, we have plausible deniability to say why, we, why nobody observed that. But here's the idea that just as uh, before a comet comes along, maybe it breaks up as it's passing through the ring the first time and spreads into a debris cloud that then hits the ring. Maybe it's the tidal force. Uh, maybe it's an earlier encounter with Saturn. But whatever it is, Every now and then, and apparently once in 1983 and not since then, uh, something comes along and shows, throws the rings of Saturn off their axis as well. So summarizing, during 1994, the impact of comet Shoemaker-Levy 9, Jupiter's ring got shoved off its axis by about two kilometers. That means cometary impacts into rings are a common event. It seems that we're seeing a one or two per decade at Jupiter. Compare this to the once a century that people used to envision, but it seems there are many more comets than that. In fact, there are recent stories from 2009 and 2010 of, of amateur observers actually seeing other objects collide into Jupiter. Uh, at Saturn, it's a smaller body, less gravity, but maybe a few times per century, something is coming along and doing the same thing to the rings of Saturn. Every time one of these impacts happens, it produces a spiral pattern that starts as a tilt and winds up over time. That means you can come back even decades later, and as long as you can still see that spiral, you can figure out when the impact happened. So in a sense, we have a comet collector. We have a recording history that we can play back at any time and find out when comets have collided with planetary rings. So as I say at the end of my article, planetary rings chronicle their own histories. And I'll stop there. Mark, we have the first question from Tom. Mark, thank you very much for uh for sh sharing your incredible passion for your uh, for your scientific discipline, uh, you, you're you're a great representative of uh, senior scientist and principal investigator here at SETI Institute. Uh, my question for you: You used a phrase during your talk that was that was beautiful, and that is um, you characterized yourself as a ring geek. <laughs> okay. okay? Uh, I think everybody, including me, because I don't know the answer to my question, I think everybody would like to know, so how did Mark Showalter become a ring geek? How, uh, it, what's the history? What brought you to be who you are today? I was, uh, okay, there's, there's, there, there's an accident of history involved, which is that I was entering, you can figure out how old you, I am now, I entered graduate school in 1979. That was exactly when Voyagers 1 and 2 were flying by Jupiter, and we're getting our first really good data on Jupiter, and that's when the ring of Jupiter was discovered, in fact. Uh, I had the good fortune of being at Cornell, where there were some people involved on the Voyager imaging team. I got working with them. They were interested in rings. Of course, the game of every graduate student is find a thesis advisor who will take you. And uh, we hit it off very well. In fact, I'm just really delighted to be able to say that third author on my paper is a gentleman named Joe Burns. He was my thesis advisor, which we wrote on the Jovian ring in 1986. So uh, it's great to still be working with Joe so many years later. But so that's part of the story. The other thing is that I have um, two things I think are sort of my particular uh, just uh, pieces that, that bring, brings it to, into focus for me. One is that I love doing image analysis. And some of you know I do photography and, and things like that. Images is, is very much a part of the kinds of things I like to do. And being able to write down an equation that describes an image that's sort of the mathematical side of my brain. And you know, people who study craters or even people who study atmospheres don't have the privilege of actually writing down the equation and then drawing the lines on the picture and showing that they actually work out. So for me, that's why those two talents sort of merge in planetary ring science. 
Cool. Let's take the question over here next. Um, I, maybe I know too much uh, physics for my own good, but uh, I think of the rings as individual particles moving on, uh, you know, more or less uh, two-body orbits. Okay. Although in this case, an oblate uh, object right. uh, being the uh, central force, uh, and so it's it's moving individually, and so the collective motion of all these individual particles is what we're really seeing not a solid ring that's you know being being tilted and so it kind of boggles my mind to think how can these individual particles all kind of look like they're acting together okay well let me um there, there are two answers to that question it's a good question there's one answer for jupiter and the other one for saturn in the case of saturn it's actually a fairly dense ring system particles collide uh, once in orbit, maybe once in the D-ring where things are a little fainter, maybe once every few orbits. But an orbit is half a day or less, eight hours maybe. So lots of collisions are happening. So you only have to tilt part of the ring and eventually that information will spread out to all the other particles that are in the same orbits because they'll eventually collide. So that covers Saturn. Jupiter is a little different because Jupiter is a very, very optically thin is the term ring. There are very few collisions. Takes, it's actually 20 to 50 years between collisions of individual ring particles. So in the case of the Jovian ring, we really are seeing something that involves particles being tilted independently of one another because they haven't collided since 1996. But the way that works actually, as it turns out, is if, uh, I, I'm just, you're just gonna have to sort of take some hand waving for this, but Shoemaker-Levy 9, if you recall, was actually a string of pearls that collided into Jupiter over a period of about four days. Uh, hour longer, depending on how you count the littlest pieces, but it was like July 16th to 20th is what people quote. So for about four days, pieces were falling into Jupiter, and at the exact same time, for that four days or so, dust was sweeping through the ring. Now the ring particles are rotating in eight hours, so essentially every ring particle is passing through this uh, stream of dust. And so even though the particles are not colliding with each other, they are all responding to the dust stream. And that's how you get the entire Jovian ring off its axis. Um, in the uh, data that you gave. Oh, you <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know where you were. <laughs> uh, you estimate the mass of the dust that hit Jupiter ring at uh, two gigatons. I, I never actually quoted a mass. It was two cubic, a couple of cubic kilometers. Okay. And that translate that. More or less. The, yeah. In yeah. fact, I could believe those were Assuming right. a density of one. Yeah. yeah. Which is, and then the one that hit Saturn would be an equivalent mass on the order of 10 megatons. Is it? Um, I, can, I can speak to the Jupiter case. Uh, when I say that's how much hit the rings, I'm really saying that's how much broke off of Shoemaker-Levy 9. So mm -hmm. we're not assuming that every particle hit the rings. Clearly it didn't. The rings are fairly right. narrow and a lot of stuff just missed. Mm -hmm. But so we're estimating the amount of dust that broke up. And in the case of the, the Saturn event, they need to invoke a similarly sized comet. But in that case, because the rings are dense, essentially every part, every, all of the comet is used. Yeah. So we're only assuming a small fraction of the comet actually ever touches a ring particle at Jupiter. But in the case of Saturn, it all does. So two questions. Uh, this would s suggest that the comet that hit Saturn was a lot smaller, possibly too small to have been observed. And then is this going to be something in the future that we could use to estimate a census of the comets in the solar system? Yeah, two, two really great questions. Um, to the first question, I don't think it is, is not, in fact, true that the event at Saturn was a smaller comet. In fact, it had to be a pretty big comet just because it had to shove that much mass around. There's a lot more mass in the Saturn system than there was in the Jupiter system. So that's part of what went into the slide I slipped through very quickly of Matt, Matt Hedman had done of just showing the calculations. But uh, essentially, it was a fairly big comet. And that's probably why there's only been one since 1983. I keep asking Matt, do you see any other waves in the data? And the answer is no, we really don't. So, uh, and then to what we can do in the future. In the case of Saturn, well, we've still got a spacecraft there, but in case something happens, only if something happens really soon, would it develop enough of a ripple pattern that we could observe it before the end of the Cassini mission. It's currently scheduled for 2017. Um, 
But Jupiter is a better case in this situation because Jupiter goes through its equinox every six years. And in fact, we were talking about 1,000 kilometer type wavelengths. We can easily get that kind of resolution on the Jovian ring system using the Hubble telescope, using adaptive optic systems such as on the Keck telescope. So essentially two periods every six years or so, we're going to have another chance to look at for features like this in the Jovian ring. And you betcha I'm going to be writing observing proposals. Right now, Jupiter is not near equinox, and we're just, we've got to wait a few years before we can start doing that. So um, Saturn's, the wave number in this ripple and Saturn's ring system has been uh, linearly increasing for the past, um, well, I guess, almost 20 years from 1983. Yes. Uh, how long will this continue? And what will happen at, you know, when it stops? Um, another good question. The, uh, I'm going to answer the wrong question first. In the case of Jupiter's ring, because things don't collide, eventually the pattern will shear out. And I do think that's, in fact, what we're seeing. So that the Shoemaker-Levy 9 pattern is kind of mostly gone now after 30 years or so. Uh, 20, whatever, 20 years. Um, there's really nothing to stop the Saturn system from rippling away until the wavelength gets to be comparable to the thickness of the rings. And the thickness of the rings is only like 10 meters or so. So a pattern like what we're seeing today it's going to be there a very long time. And whether you have the instruments to see a 20 meter long pattern of waves in the Saturn system, or maybe there are some now and we just can't see them because none of our instruments are that good. But those patterns are going to be there for literally centuries. So that would indicate that maybe if we could do a really high resolution scan of the Saturn ring system, we could see these older patterns that maybe have, you know, are now less than a kilometer. And maybe we could get a history of the comet impact of Saturn's rings. I like to think that would be so. Unfortunately, as far as imaging is concerned, we're really at the limit of what the instrument can do. Now, there are other instruments that, uh, I mean, I want the Cassini Rings Working Group comprises people studying rings with all the different instruments on Cassini. And there are ways to get higher resolution about the rings, including occultations, which was one that I showed you. So maybe, but you only, it's got to be just the right geometry, kind of a slanting edge on geometry that really highlights these features. So maybe one of the other instruments will be able to push it further and show us the 19th century impacts into Saturn's rings and the early 20th century impacts. There. But in principle, they're there. Um, the, image, the, the images really just aren't going to be able to pull out anything more subtle than what we've seen now. Maybe the other instruments can, but that's, that's something for other people to do. Yes. Oh. Uh, I'm thinking about maybe th two or three different kinds of possibilities that we might be seeing here. If you take a coin and spin it on edge as it goes down, it starts chirping up more rapidly as it comes to rest, and it precesses at the same time. And instead of a coin, if you have a bunch of concentric rings, they're all going to be doing this independently. And the other thing is that if you think of the rings as having particles that go from, well, a water droplet doesn't form until you have six molecules. Once you've got six molecules, you've got the smallest water drop. That these things would be like clouds where as the dust goes through, it would create droplets, and then these droplets would come into existence and drop out of existence as you're going along, you know, as, as clouds puff up and go down. I, yeah, that's, that's interesting ideas. I don't really know. We do know quite a bit about the sizes of the particles in the rings, and in the case of Jupiter, it's not even made of water ice. It's basically sort of dirt. It's basically, you know, dark carbonaceous material. Uh, in the case of Saturn, most of the ring particles are kind of centimeters to tens of meters. So, so the, and it's been pretty well shown that there aren't really tiny, these micron-sized particles. There aren't really very many micron-sized particles in the rings of Saturn. So I'm not quite sure. It's an interesting idea, but I don't quite see how it would work in this case. Mark, we have a, uh, a ah. special SETI antique oh, mug. Thank you. Antique. Uh, yes. Okay. It's, uh, to uh, commemorate your talk uh, today, and uh, uh, if you'd like to ask any questions of Mark or uh, any any ideas on diving spots to go to, <laughs> feel free to come up and approach him. Um, and just an advertisement: in two weeks' time, we actually have our next evening uh, speaker for May. That's Heidi Hamill. Uh, 
Oh, she'll be talking about uh, the James Webb Telescope uh, and using it to uh, do planetary observations. So please join me in uh, thanking Mark for his great talk tonight. Thank you.